can speak for the old order Amish but themselves, and they have seldom chosen to do so. They distrust many words. Their life is their testimony. At the New Holland, Pennsylvania horse auction, which thrives on their trade, they enjoy a free and friendly mingling with their neighbors. Although their costume keeps them distinct, they're ready to do business with people of the world. They are involved as buyers and sellers and jockeys. Normally, they will not willingly face the camera because they take the Ten Commandments seriously, including the one against making a graven image or likeness. When they talk among themselves, they use the language of their forefathers, a dialect of Switzerland and southern Germany. They cherish it as the language of their faith and their community. Their ancestors were Swiss mountain farmers from the canton of Bern, already a stubbornly rural and tradition-loving people. They sidestepped the priesthood in the Reformation of the 1520s and began to read the Bible and meet in groups with lay leaders. In simple response to the teachings of Jesus, they abandoned warfare, refused to take civil oaths, and made baptism an act of voluntary adult commitment to the church. The state church establishment viewed their existence as a mortal threat, and persecution drove many of them north and west of the Rhine particularly into the Alsace region. Here they found good land and more freedom to live quietly. In 1693 they experienced a division under an aggressively strict leader named Jacob Amen over issues such as the severity of church discipline and uniformity in clothing. Amen's followers have since been called Amish and the larger, more liberal group, Mennonites. In these Alsatian villages today there are no more Amish as a result of 18th and 19th century migrations to America. In the New World, religious tolerance and rich farmland allowed the Amish to prosper. In the 20th century, they have grown to some 75,000, scattered through 20 states and provinces. Harley Wagler left his Amish community in Kansas for the university at 19. He tells what it's like to grow up on an Amish farm. Right from the very start, he develops an Amish way of looking at things simply because he doesn't have much opportunity to be exposed to other influences. So that you are extremely conscious of your family, your home setting. Even in the toys you play with, many of them are homemade or hand-me-downs from your parents or even grandparents. You are very close to nature. I remember I used to spend hours as a child walking out through the trees looking at insects, birds, animals. They fascinated me. And it was part of my growing up. one-room schoolhouse is all you need to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, which will fit students to live in their farming community. When the larger society discarded the 19th century type schools, 
the Amish set up a system in order to preserve them for themselves. Here the father can be confident that his teaching at home is not cancelled out in his children's education. As a lay trustee, he writes and signs the rules for the school he pays for without state funds. Textbooks printed by an Amish publishing house stress the virtues of humility, duty, truthfulness, kindness, and orderliness. Teaching about God is often considered too sacred for the school and left to the church and home. The teacher is usually a young woman with a grade school education who has shown aptitude in learning. The Amish teach their children two languages, generation after generation. It's the parents, rather than the state, who love their children for time and eternity. And they feel a solemn obligation to nurture their children through innocence to the point of marriage and entering the adult community of work and faith. Between the time when parents yield their control over their children's minds and the time the community takes over, the peer group is of extreme importance. Simplicity is prized. The Amish do not expect the world to understand this. Learning or reading as ends in themselves are seen as detrimental, since they do not prepare a person with the practical skills and tastes needed for life in an Amish community. The Amish have been given the right to substitute for the required high school years training in work at home, carefully recorded in a daily journal, which is reviewed by an instructor. By the time Amish children are 14, most of them prefer to leave school for practical vocational activities. Their families need them economically, and that gives them a sense of worth. At recess, there's plenty of chance for exercise without expensive worldly sports equipment. Physical and social enjoyment, rather than competitiveness, is the point of the game. The Amish were deeply moved by the words of Chief Justice Warren Burger in the landmark Supreme Court decision of 1972, which recognized the legality of the Amish educational way within the American system. Justice Berger wrote, There can be no assumption that today's majority is right and the Amish and others like them are wrong. A way of life that is odd or even erratic but interferes with no rights or interests of others is not to be condemned because it is different. An Amish farmer's horses are a prized possession. We used to regard them almost as members of the family. We always fed them very well, took care of them very well during the winter. Horses have their own personality anyway. The standard color for the Amish buggy in Lancaster County is gray. Made by his own people, it may cost the Amishman as much as $3,000. He resisted electric lights until modern traffic and state laws made them necessary. Now his lights flash a constant warning along country roads, pre-20th century vehicle ahead. As the gap widens between the Amish ways and those of their neighbors, place is saved for them in a kind of amazement that such ways could survive so far into the 20th century. And it isn't easy. Clothing, like all other aspects of Amish society, 
is strictly defined by what the Amish call their ordnung. The ordnung is the set of rules which the ministers present. This is the set of rules you live by. Having stopped the clock of style centuries ago, the Amish make their clothing express obedience to the ordnung of the congregation and the suppression of hochmut, or pride. The opposite of pride is demut, or humility. Demut is, it is what you would like to be characterized by, because this is godliness. They delight in the natural colors of the earth, but they very carefully control the use of those colors so that they never become a means by which the individual asserts himself or herself over against the community. Innocent children are not in as much danger of exploiting color for egotistic purposes. But even their dress must declare their identity. By her later teens, the girl's head is always covered, and she always wears an apron, symbol not only of humility, but readiness for work. On weekdays, a kerchief may be allowed, but when meeting the public or on Sundays, she wears her cap neatly starched and a Sunday dress which will later serve for weekday use. You know, it is possible even within the limitations of Amish dress to demonstrate hochmut if you stretch the limitations of the ordnung. For example, at home, we were not to wear pockets on our shirts because you could put nice things in here and these would be visible. Some of the young people would wear these. This was, in a sense, rebellion, but it was also hochmut. It was one way of saying, look at me, look at what I have that you don't have. That is hochmut. And uh, it's very important, especially for a married person, not to demonstrate this. Demut is the thing that you must strive for. It shows in the simple, old-fashioned profile of their houses. When they buy a farm, they will not destroy what is already built, though they may tear out the electric wiring. When they add buildings themselves, their stress on simplicity is expressed in a severe plainness. Several generations, and sometimes several families, live on the same farm. When parents turn over the main work of the farm to sons or sons-in-law, they will move into a smaller section of the house called the Dotty, or grandfather's house. If there is none, one will be built on. An amazing composite architecture evolves, sometimes end to end, sometimes clustered like a crazy quilt. Roofs and gables and windows and porches form a pattern that means love for the transgenerational family. New farms continue to be cut out of larger ones as the encroaching city shrinks the available acreage. Even non-farming families must have room for horse and buggy. To be humble, an Amish home must be simple, but it's always substantial and, in its strictness, often beautiful. Inside, it's just as plain and functional. There's enough space in the kitchen for it to serve as a combination living and family room. There may be some modern plumbing, but there's no electricity, and the atmosphere of an earlier time persists. The pressurized gas lamp stays on all evening. It provides plenty of light to visit or read by. Reading material is usually limited to devotional, historical, and practical subjects, with some harmless fiction and several regular Amish periodicals like The Diary or Family Life. The traditional farmer's almanac, listing Christian holidays and astrological data, sometimes contains a directory of Amish settlements. The sitting room is for company, and a few nice things in it speak for hospitality more than pride. 
A fancy calendar is acceptable because it's old-fashioned. Consciousness of the family extends back through the generations. Students of genetic diseases have turned to the Amish family records for research data. The word of God, in German, has the place of respect in the sitting room. Plenty of chairs provide for long Sunday afternoons of visiting. The strictest of the Amish would have no upholstered furniture. Folding doors can be opened to make a large area for church services at home. By Saturday afternoon, preparations for a day of worship and visiting are nearly completed. The Amish don't go to a church. Their church meets in their homes. A special wagon transports benches from house to house. This home has a carriage shop, so chairs are brought out to it from the house. They have no altar or holy place, in keeping with their understanding of the words of Jesus, where two or three of you have gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Here the congregation will sit for a four-hour service of singing, preaching, and praying. All ages will attend. Chairs are supplied in the front rows for aged members and ministers. The preaching will be done by men without special training who have been selected for the role of minister from the congregation by the casting of lots. On Sunday morning when the people arrive in church, they stop before the church house or the house and turn the wheels to one side so that the ladies can get out of the buggy. Then they drive on out in front of the barn and unhitch the horse, take the horse back into the barn, and then they usually come back out through the milk parlor. And there they stand and visit until it's time to go in. Adult men, or the married men, will go in together. And the young fellows will always stay and go in just at the very last minute. And uh, this is always a very exciting experience because it's usually arranged so that when you come in, you have to walk in front of all the other people and then circle around behind and sit on the back bench. So this is a very exciting experience, especially if you know that the girls out in the kitchen will be watching you as you walk in. And uh, usually there's a problem deciding where you're going to put your hat, and then you look around for nails on the wall, or sometimes you just put it underneath your bench. But the ministers, when they come in, they always sit down together, and only then do they take off their hats. And then here again, it's interesting to see them looking around, where am I going to put my hat? It's uh, really a beautiful, homey atmosphere. For their congregational singing, the Amish use the Ausbund, or Selection, the oldest Protestant hymn book in continuous use. It consists mainly of martyr ballads and spiritual songs written by European Anabaptists in the 16th century. They sing by oral tradition, embellishing the ancient melodies almost beyond recognition. Usually the minister stands in the doorway between these two rooms so that he can speak to one group and then the other. And while they are preaching, they will usually develop a rhythm, kind of sing-song method of delivery. The Amishmen will accept a new invention or implement, but only after it is clear that this will not change his way of life, or threaten his community and the rules that bind it together, or make him a slave to what people call progress. 
once he is allowed by his church the use of a side delivery rake, he outfits it with his own kind of wheels, minus rubber tires. Too much mobility would make the pace of life hectic. It would be too modern. Some old order Mennonites who share this dislike of modernity have decided that they can accept tractors, but only with steel wheels. The old order Amishman is not yet ready for self-propelled equipment. This, he fears, would set off a chain reaction whereby everybody would follow the principles of efficiency and convenience to the neglect of humility and communal discipline. Still, he doesn't object to the internal combustion engine and places it on horse-drawn equipment without any concern for his neighbor's inability to figure out what seems to be an inconsistency. It makes sense to the Amishman. It simply means that he will not let modern technology run away with his community or his family at its own pace. He'll accept some progress, but he won't sacrifice to progress all contact with the past and its virtues. He will keep the simple rhythms and human-sized implements that will allow him to live humbly, in community, and in a friendly relation with the earth God gives him, and to save what the machine would waste. On a modern farm, a self-propelled combine would require only one person for the whole grain harvesting operation. What the Amish lose in speed, they gain in fellowship. Work under the right circumstances is as enjoyable as play. Shared work is, in many cases, the Amishman's recreation. A tractor is allowed for belt power but not to pull equipment in the field. That would be crossing an invisible technological line that the Amish define for the sake of their community. They sense just how much change their community can support without coming apart at the seams by getting onto the uncontrollable escalator of progress. By resisting technological change, or at least slowing it down to controllable speed, the Amish also keep their old people from becoming obsolete as fast as the machinery of their youth is outmoded. Maintaining simple ways of farming lessens the distance between the generations. Shared within the family, hard work becomes a seasonal ritual. You've done it before with your parents, and you'll do it again in the same way with your children. Greater speed and size in their implements might eliminate some labor, but the Amish find their happiness and meaning in labor, rather than in escape from it. If our electronic civilization should fall, the Amish might be the last to miss it. They have never stopped employing the simple sources of energy that make nature seem like a friend. The wind lifts water to an old railroad tank car upended at a spot on the farm higher than the buildings, and gravity takes it back down to the faucet. Wind isn't the only free energy the Amishman taps. By damming the stream in his meadow, the farmer stores up enough power to turn a little wheel, even when there's no wind. It works for the family night and day by converting the weight of falling water into a backward and forward motion. This motion is conveyed up to the house and barn by a cable. And even when the neighbor's electricity goes off, 
there'll be constant running water for man and beast on this Amish farm. So much of what seems different about the Amish is only they're continuing to practice what everybody used to, long after almost everybody else has stopped doing it. By not forgetting the art of the windmill, the Amish preserve for the rest of us a visual link with our own pre-urbanized past. John A. Hostetler, author of the book Amish Society, grew up on a Pennsylvania Amish farm. What we see in the Amish community is children closely identified sitting on the lap of their father, harrowing in the fields or riding the horse. First, of course, he helps to do things with his mother and father, whether perhaps in the garden or perhaps in the uh, chicken house, uh, and to imitate the adults in various ways. I remember when I was a kid, I was so fascinated by the thrashing we did on our farm. And I made myself a little thrashing machine. That was pure imitation of what my older brothers and my father were doing. And I could identify with that. He begins to work as soon as he is physically capable. You ask him to gather the eggs as soon as he's able to carry a bucket out into the chicken house. He is taught to have responsibility. As you grow older, you get more and more responsibilities. And then eventually you get to the place where you can do the chores so that if dad is gone, he doesn't have to worry about being at home on time. And it's very serious to accept your responsibilities and fulfill them. You may have a fancy car, brand new house. Nothing is dearer to the Amish than their family. Their children want to be together in heaven. But I want us to be together in heaven. I want us to be together in heaven. I want to walk down the street of your God. I want to run through the fields of Green clover, see the mansion, smell the flowers, hear the singing, it's all ours. See the river gently flowing, feel the gentle breezes blowing, but I want us to be together in heaven. You like play very much too. But in order to enjoy play, it's good to have some work done so that you feel you deserve play. At farm auctions, Amish and Old Order Mennonite boys sometimes play corner bowl, a form of dodgeball with a homemade leather-covered ball thrown from four corners. Here the Mennonites are throwing, and the Amish are in the ring. When he's hit, he has to leave the ring. If the thrower misses, he's out. The game will go on most of the day. Sometimes there are two games, one for the smaller boys. an unwritten law in Amish 
society whereby young people are given more liberties than old people. After you are married, you are not expected to transgress any of the ordinary. But they wink at these among younger people. This varies from group to group, but at home this meant dressing up the horse's harness or turning up the brims of your hat. A girl would start attending the singings where they get together for hymn sings on Sunday night at uh, perhaps 15 or 16. The boy, generally 16 or 17, uh, and they would learn to associate with their peers, first of all, in this rather large uh, assembly of uh, young people. And they would belong to a peer group, which they sometimes call a gang. It's that group that sort of controls what you do and where you go. In fact, you may go to this for a whole year before you even have a date. A young boy would be embarrassed to ask for his first date, so he'd never, he'd just wait. He would, he would ask uh, his sister for, uh, to ask a certain girl for a date, whether she, he could take her home that night in the buggy seat. You want to have a good harness, and you like to have eight or ten ivory rings on the lines that stretch back from the horse to the driver. The first girl I dated, I said, I hope, <laughs> I hope you don't think I'm kindish or foolish for having dressed up my buggy so much. Oh, no, she said, I think it's beautiful. Amish girls lovingly build up a trousseau as they anticipate marriage. They almost never plan for independent careers. As long as a girl wishes to be Amish, she finds women's liberation ridiculous. But if she becomes marginal in her loyalties and begins to look elsewhere for her identity, it's another story. I think the Amish child working as he would, doing a full day's job from the age of 16 to 21, has a lot of time to think as he's working in the fields with horses and deep sleep at night, I think the meaning of life becomes focused so that the person may, may perhaps reject it for a year or he may become somewhat marginal, uh, but eventually comes back and makes a decision. Now, if he decides to join and later leaves, obviously he will be excommunicated and shunned because he would have broken a vow. They respect the family and the church tremendously. I have a good friend in the Old Order Church, and happily married. He was working in a trailer factory for a number of years and didn't like this. But I remember when we were young people going together, there were many, many discussions that we had. Since the option was open, do we want to join a church where we can drive cars? and have radios and telephones and things like this? Or are we going to stay in the Amish church and be faithful to our heritage? He stayed in the church. He's very happy. He has a nice Amish wife and two children. And they live just as simply as his parents did. And I also think he is satisfied with himself because he feels that he has not betrayed his parents. He said it's much better to be back on the farm because you are closer to God. About 80 Amish couples a year begin housekeeping in Lancaster County, and each new couple needs a new buggy. Making these and replacements for worn out or wrecked buggies provides work for men who are crowded off the farm. Here, crafts that have been largely forgotten elsewhere thrive and are handed on. The trend toward collecting and restoring antiques brings to this shop more restoration work than the crew can handle. Power equipment is run by compressed air supplied by a diesel engine. Rather than electricity from the public utility, 
which is forbidden by the ordinal. Hard to get replacement parts for horse-drawn implements can still be bought here, as well as the special supplies for which an Amish community preserves an unusual demand. Some features of the modern factory do intrude into the atmosphere of the traditional family workshop. The Amishman feels that it's his responsibility to be neighborly to his neighbor, to be a good neighbor, to help him if he needs help, and also to ask him for help if he needs help. They will not hesitate to ask a good neighbor for automobile transportation, though once they join the church, they may not own cars themselves. While they do use some folk remedies and would not study medicine in a university, they appreciate and gladly pay for good medical and hospital service. The same goes for the telephone, which they may not have in their homes. That would allow convenience to dictate the family atmosphere, rather than simplicity and loyalty to the congregation of Christ, which they call the Gamay. And keeping the little telephone booth on the other side of the road, or halfway in the lane, or at least no closer than the porch, holds the proud world at a controllable distance from the minds of the precious children. When circumstances bring Amish children into direct contact with the world, the pressure to conform is overwhelming. Their parents do not have to look far to see what they do not want for their children. Home with the daily chores is the safe place for Amish children to grow up. Because the milking machine makes it possible for the family dairy to stay in business, it has been accepted. Economic pressures have forced them to reconsider an earlier ban on bulk milk tanks. They are constantly struggling with questions. What should we permit and what should we not permit? They did not permit bulk tanks for many years, but they have just permitted them in order to keep more of the Amish farmers working on the farm rather than having to go to the trailer factories or somewhere else. It isn't as cut and dried as we think, perhaps. The Amish like to do business in one-to-one -one relationships where they can buy and sell what they raise or make or bake at home. There's a simplicity and directness about a farmer's market that make it, with the public auction, one of the few places where the Amish meet the world freely without any threat to their way of life. are responsible for this or not, they are going to be affected by it. And it's shameful in some ways to see this happening to them. I'll just take it like that. So how much do I owe you? expresses his mixed feelings. They, I don't know what, what they read in some of these cities and so on, but uh, I don't know what they expect to see, really. But uh, the shoemaker, right across the road from the bank, and uh, there's a tourist stop there, and he come in and asked Mose Bottler, he was an old Amish man, he asked Mose where you can see the Amish people. Well, he said, you just drive up the road here, you might meet some. And he was talking to one. <laughs> so what they expect to see, I don't know. <laughs> well, they advertise for it. They advertise for it. I mean, they're prepared for it. They expect them. Maybe that's why they've got all that tourist traffic. It's, it's so a, a, a hazardous on the roads. You're driving along with your horse and wagon, and, and the tourists may be coming this way, and a car in back of you, and the, the tourist will just stop sometimes right in the middle of the road. See 
what what's coming, you know. It's, uh, they're really a nuisance, if I dare say that. They are. They want to talk to you, and and if you're busy, uh, some of them don't even know what they're asking you. you know? The Amish are literally, they believe, in the hands of God. There are increasingly accidents on the road, and it's a problem for the Amish people to cross the major highways. Accidents will happen, and I think the Amish are somewhat resigned to them. When Amish communities change, they often take on evangelistic interests. They would probably think that they want to be getting away from traditions that are obsolete. That's the way they would look at it. Uh, and they would ha want to have more of the personal experience and articulation of how they feel, whether they have uh, been saved, uh, whether they have the assurance of salvation. Uh, now all those terms are come from the fundamentalist tradition, I believe, and they are foreign to the Old Order Amish, who regard them as the individualism ruling over the community. So that's why it's threatening to the, uh, to the traditional community. With their rural neighbors, Amish farmers are unable to match the prices developers are willing to pay for open land. Yeah, this land situation is, is a problem. I mean, uh, uh, the young man that, that wants to start up farming and his dad can't buy a farm for him, he just licked. And he can't buy a farm and stop it. It's just out. Those Amish who want their children to stay on the soil really have to move out of Lancaster County. There is no more, there are no more farms for them. So they have started new small communities elsewhere. As the older communities keep growing in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana, younger ones expand in rural New York, Kentucky, Missouri, and Wisconsin. Those who've decided to stay are going into craft production and uh, making things that can be sold at the end of the farm lane or in tourist shops and so on. Cottage industries grow exponentially in large, older communities. Shops, begun to keep families out of public employment, put quietly growing pressure on local zoning ordinances. Some farmers find off-season employment in recycling old buildings. Men hauled surprising distances by non-Amish drivers do good quality work for surprisingly low wages. There's little waste motion for an Amish worker, less break time than normal, and even with a long ride from home and back, a full day of work. Restoring instead of demolishing a decaying barn in a newly suburban landscape becomes viable with Amish help. Working away from his home community, an Amish contractor may use some modern machinery to keep his non-union crew small and make his rates affordable. All along, the growing side effects of new technology on the communal safeguards are carefully monitored by spiritual leaders. A 1984 feature film, Witness, set Hollywood-type erotic and violent scenes over against Amish community. Shown worldwide, it tapped a deep longing for a more peaceful life. There were protests against its more obvious distortions. Most Amish ignored it. Conversions to Amish life occurred, though some were temporary. The film itself fed the relentless growth of tourism in Amish areas. When moral breaches like youthful drug use do occur, the Amish do not excuse them. 
aware that they've become intriguing icons. They don't shape their ways to opinions in the media. They also experience sympathy from the world. In Lancaster County, a Harvard-trained couple focuses the latest medical research on genetically based illness. Central Pennsylvania, too, has an old Amish community in the Kishikaquillis, or Big Valley. Another straddles the border with Maryland. The largest Amish community of all is in central Ohio, where the scenery has produced the nickname Little Switzerland. Here there are variations in buggy colors, dress patterns, or the flourishes on the tune sung every Sunday across North America. And here too, as in Indiana, the tourist traffic thickens yearly. When the Amishman's body is returned to the earth he has tilled, he is surrounded in death as he was in life by his community. Here, man, discover what you are. Learn here what your existence is. How swiftly flees your span of life from time into eternity. The strength of the Amish community is dramatically visualized after a barn or house burns. The Amishman is never alone in his troubles, and he is bailed out by people he knows, rather than by a commercial insurance policy. Of course, the, the barn, after it burns down, and it has to be a cleanup period for a couple, uh, perhaps a couple weeks, and a preparation uh, for uh, raising the barn, and that is done by experienced, you might say almost semi-professional Amish builders. And then when they are ready to put the beams together, that's when everybody comes with a hammer and a saw, and uh, whatever it is you can do best with, you bring your own tool. And uh, you simply gang up with somebody else and work together. I think it is an, an honest articulation of uh, fulfilling a need in the community where everybody gets together and helps each other uh, rather than the individual who suffered loss goes off somewhere to the city to collect on an insurance policy uh, and then he still has to do it himself in a kind of a bureaucratic way because he has to make uh, uh, contracts with people to do it in, in the Amish fashion, it's simply people getting together, realizing that uh, they are needed and they do contribute, and uh, rest restoration of loss, I think, is perhaps symbolic also of their uh, religion. The Amish emphasize doing rather than 
uh, saying. Um, affirmation of belief is important, but uh, doing is, is highly emphasized. You know, people are not invited to come, but they simply come. A non-Amish person or neighbor may come to help. For the Amish, it's a functional thing. It's a, it's a mutual aid and a restoration of property, but for the outside world and the neighbors who come and look, I think it is uh, an enactment of uh, a symbol which, uh, which they themselves have sort of lost. the community as ready as ever for mutual aid. Within hours, the cleanup begins, and in two days, the foundation is laid for a new barn. Red Cross workers marvel. A local official says, I've never seen anything like it. In a week or so, the cows, having been cared for by neighbors, are milked in the new barn. They are a people who, in their respect for the law of God, cherish the earth and keep it, who will not sacrifice community for convenience, who have not been caught up in progress, who believe that order brings unity and contentment, a people who have not yet been able to accept fully the first stages of the Industrial Revolution, though they live in its latter phase a people who don't discard the past, who fear pride, and who don't argue with nature, who know how to accept limits, who live what they believe, people who are in the world, but not of it, a people of preservation, a people of God. <laughs> 